Good to see you, Matt. Thanks so much for uh, um, being the moderator on this. I really appreciate it. And Tiffany? Well, uh, what do you call it? I can't go bad. I, pay, I charge them by the minute. It works out pretty good. <laughs> And so we are we are um we are live. Okay. Right okay. now. Right now. So give me one moment. And we shall begin. So um Matt's gonna serve as our moderator this evening. And um my name is Tiffany Rivera. I am the Director of Government Affairs for New Mexico Farm and Livestock Bureau, and I want to thank you guys for joining us um, in our continuing series of Congressional Forums on Agriculture. Um, I want to take a moment to thank um, all of the supporting organizations that helped um, put the forum on. Uh, special thanks to cattle growers, special thanks to New Mexico wool growers, um, dairy producers of New Mexico, the New Mexico Chile Association, the New Mexico Association of Conservation Districts, uh, Farm Credit of New Mexico, and Dairy Farmers of America. Um, thank you to everyone who has helped, and um, I'm going to hand it over to Matt so that we can get started with tonight's event. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Representative Social Torres Small, thank you for being with us this evening. Let's see, where did everybody go here in the hurry? I don't see anything right now. Let's see if I can get back in. Okay. Uh, my name is Matt Martinez. Um, I'm uh, my wife and myself um, uh, have a small business. We are in the radio uh, broadcasting business up north. We have four radio stations in Las Vegas and one here in Albuquerque. Actually, the backdrop is the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Uh, I'm on that board, and uh, so far we haven't been able to take that off my computer. So we're excited to have it. Um, I served as a city councilor for one term in Las Vegas and as mayor, I served as one term. Prior to that, I spent 25 years in the propane business. And uh, as of late, I was the legislative representative on the New Mexico Broadcasters Board for about 20 years. So uh, trying to get back on, on track here. Tonight, I uh, just wanna remind folks that the New Mexico Agricultural Forum does not support any candidates. They have invited all, candidate, all candidates to participate in this forum, and we're excited uh, this evening to have Representative Sochil Torres Small with us, and I am going to turn it over to her so that she can give us a proper introduction. Matt, thank you so much, and I just want to thank the New Mexico Farm and Livestock Bureau for your work in uh, really advocating for farmers and ranchers across New Mexico. I deeply enjoy the opportunity to work with you and with the farmers and ranchers that you serve. Uh, growing up in the Mesilla Valley, you know, I, um, I think some folks think of Las Cruces as being the big city, and it certainly is in South, in, in the second congressional district, but it also uh, just depends so much on the hardworking agricultural economy that we have all across New Mexico's second congressional district. District. And so growing up, I remember on my walk from my house to Picacho Middle, Middle School that, you know, we would go through cotton fields and beyond. And, and I remember spending summers in, um, at, some, at my cousin's ranch, uh, my uncle's ranch uh, in Colorado. And uh, the real devastation that we all felt um, when, when he had to sell that ranch uh, after, after getting a divorce. Uh, but so I know just enough to know that there is so much more that I don't know when it comes to the hard work that happens uh, in the ag sector. And that's why I'm so deeply grateful for farmers across the district, for the New Mexico Farm and Livestock Bureau, who've taken the time to help me learn as I've gotten on the House Ag Committee and had an opportunity to advocate for all of you. Uh, whether it's on issues like United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement and talking with local dairy farmers, talking with pecan growers about the impact that would have on increased trade uh, and, and the challenges that they face in terms of making sure that the USMCA gets fully implemented and the opportunities to continue to work together to make that happen. Or whether it's addressing the challenging labor issues, um, talking again with pecan farmers after an ice raid or talking um, about the, the issues right now when it comes to COVID-19 and unemployment and how do we get the labor force that we need 
need to make sure that we're able to pick our famous green chili. Uh, these are the, the important things that we need to do and that we can only do by working together. Uh, as we prepare for, uh, as we work to make sure that we are fully implementing the, um, the farm bill, making sure that money that gets taken from the CCC for COVID relief gets put back into the CCC for the programs that farmers relay, rely on day in and day out. Uh, I'm committed to continuing to work with all of you, uh, navigating challenges when it comes to the Endangered Species Act, uh, when it comes to our increasing water scarcity, and making sure that I'm working with water managers and water users so that we can find the best ways to overcome uh, drought as it continues to uh, impact New Mexico. So I'm just so deeply grateful for all this opportunity to have this discussion. And with that, I look forward to hearing from your questions and uh, continuing to learn about how I can best serve New Mexico's farmers and ranchers. Thank you very much, Representative. And uh, when you see Daylene uh, sort of pop up on the screen, that means you have 15 uh, seconds before uh, the uh, question uh, times a lot is, uh, is, is almost done. Let's start off with our first question, and then we're going to be getting questions from some of our uh, viewers this evening. In times of critical drought, how can you ensure that water allotted to agriculture makes it to the state's farmers and ranchers? And how should water utilization be prioritized during these trying and limited times? That's a great question, and especially right now. Uh, I was just uh, meeting with several hay and other farmers in Valencia County who are really struggling right now um, and, and trying to make the most of a really difficult situation where folks thought it was going to be a good water year because of the snowpack in Colorado and because of various factors, uh, including kind of evaporation rate, uh, there were some real challenges and, and they didn't have access to the water they thought they would. And what I heard over and and over again. Then, just as I heard when I worked for um, the New Mexico Water uh, Adjudication Judge, uh, and when I when I uh, worked for Senator Udall on the water conferences, was that transparency, having the information to make the best possible decisions, is crucial. Um, I again at the um, when I was talking with farmers just recently, uh, one woman said, "You know, we're working really hard to to address the challenges, and I think it's only going to get harder uh, as we experience climate change and coming into a La Nina." A year where it's it's always historically uh, really dry. So I think we're ent we're getting ready to, ready to enter into another really uh, rough time. And another guy jumped in and he said, "Yeah, you know, farmers always um, farmers are some of the biggest gamblers, but we like to at least be informed gamblers. And that's what it means when we find make sure that there's transparency in terms of how water is managed. So I was proud to work with Elephant Butte Irrigation District and. Um, and the Pecos Valley uh, Artesian Conservancy District to, to put together the Western Water Security Act, making sure that all water managers could be part of that, um, could receive some of that support for addition, additional um, water smart funds, for example, additional uh, reviews and assessments of our aquifers and, and how we can use more groundwater storage and investing in opportunities for better management of our water. Uh, we're gonna have to work together to do it. There's gonna need to be transparency and uh, we're gonna have to invest resources, also in expanding the pie, whether it's through things like desalination projects in rural communities and finding other ways to, to better share uh, the water that we have. Sounds good. Thank you very much for that. The next question is, the Farm Bill is vitally important to New Mexico farmers and ranchers. What are you, your thoughts regarding the preservation of beneficial programs within the bill and how would you help your constituents take advantage of these resources that are often available but challenging to access. That is such a key point, and it's something I'm learning more and more about the Farm Bill uh, in, in terms as we work to implement it, um, seeing some of the challenges that folks are facing. Now, first and foremost, we've got to make sure we're protecting the funds, whether it's commodity, uh, the commodity program and supporting onions, or whether it's our specialty crops and supporting uh, nuts and, uh, and our green chili, uh, but working to make sure that th that support is still there. Um, also, when it comes to uh, farm insurance, that those programs are accessible and available. But then the other piece of it is, as I've um, gone through this little less than a year on the committee, uh, 
recognizing that right now a lot of those programs are kind of tailored towards a certain part of the United States and it's leaving New Mexico behind. Uh, whether it's, I, I know some of you were on the call that I, I had with Chairman Peterson who represents the Midwest uh, and some of the smaller dairies. Uh, and I see it as my job and I am a broken record on making sure that all dairies receive the same level of support, that it's proportional to the work that they're doing for our ag economy and when it comes to the market. Uh, we shouldn't have programs that are tailored just for less than 15% of the milk market. Instead, everyone should be able to access and realistically use those programs. So I'll continue to be uh, a broken record on that and work to make sure that, that across, the, uh, across our ag economy in the United States, folks are treated fairly. Thank you very much, Representative. Another question. What is your opinion of how the Endangered Species Act is being administered here in New Mexico? You know, I've seen some real challenges with that. And uh, when it comes to uh, the extent to which farmers and ranchers are included at the beginning in terms of, of managing the, the land and the resource, uh, I think folks have really been left behind. Uh, you can see that in the Mexican gray wolf uh, situation in Catron County, um, where programs were designed that really don't uh, acknowledge the challenges that ranchers face every day, whether it's going through the process of how you would prove a wolf depredation or the time that it takes to wait to get those funds when you need resources now, or the fact that it's nowhere near the full uh, value of the cow. And that's why I'm interested in finding a way to increase the value of um, those, uh, th those payments, but also uh, to try to do more payments that are um, a payment for presence. So you don't have to spend so much time proving whether or not uh, the cow was, was killed by a wolf, but actually just recognizing that the presence of a wolf means you're going to have to expend more resources for, uh, the, for, for types of management, and that there could be challenges there, that there clearly are challenges there. So I think part of the, the failure of that program was, was not uh, being able to, to design uh, the response in a way that really would serve ranchers. I think there's a similar situation that we're going to be facing at an even bigger head right now when it comes to the Silvery Minnow and the Rio Grande. As I mentioned, we're getting ready to head into another uh, dry, dry couple of years. And so management of the river is going to be crucial. And we don't want to waste water with multiple flows. So we should be working now to make sure farmers have as much of a sense as possible possible about when they're going to be getting um, that surface water and how we can best work to most efficiently use that water. Um, there have been places where I think there are some better models for how to deal with the ESA. Um, if you look in the southeast, whether it's the lizard or the lesser prairie chicken, um, Early, early collaborations can sometimes uh, actually avoid classification of an endangered species or help better provide pr predictability um, in, in the case that someone that, that a species is classified um, to, to have everyone on the same page about how they're going to deal with it. So I think there are opportunities to do that uh, and we should be doing that more often. And that requires early collaboration with farmers, not as an afterthought, but as a fundamental part of the solution. Thank you very much. Uh... We are visiting with Representative Sochil Torres Small here with the New Mexico Agriculture Forum. And we want to invite our participants who are watching. If you've got a, a question you'd like for us to ask of the representative, uh, please put it down in the Q&A portion of the Zoom meeting at the bottom. And we will try to, our best to get it on for the representative to answer. Following up with our next question, what should the United States do to change its immigration system, if reelected, how do you see your office engaging on the issue of agricultural labor, ag guest worker program, and border security? Thank you so much for the question. Oh, let's see, did we, there we go, we're better. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question. I rep representing about 180 miles of US-Mexico border, I know the reality on the ground. And I'm actually the only member of the Homeland Security Committee that actually represents a district along the US-Mexico border, which I think uh, is a necessary uh, experience. And I work really hard to uh, work with Republicans and Democrats on that committee to make sure that they see some of the realities that we face on the ground. And a lot of that is farmers and ranchers 
who work uh, right along the border, uh, as well as farmers across the district who depend on labor, on a safe legal workforce um, that's reliable and, and, and the challenges that they face with ICE when that isn't possible. And so that's why I know we've got to have strong, smart, and fair border security policies, and that a fundamental piece of that is a clear and moral immigration system to make sure that people who want to work hard, for example, in our ag economy and follow our laws and contribute to our economy have a clear way to do that, that isn't tied up in red tape that makes it really unaccessible for smaller farmers. So when it comes to the border security side, the first piece of legislation that I introduced in Congress was uh, to, to create a rural recruitment and retention plan for Border Patrol agents, because I know based on the different sectors of every of the border uh, that there are different challenges. And one of the biggest challenges in the boot heel is not having the workforce that you need to be able uh, to do interdictions. And so uh, I was pleased to, to introduce that with Congressman Will Hurd, Republican in Texas, who has similar challenges and will continue to work to get that passed in the next Congress. Uh, similarly, I worked uh, with Dan Crenshaw, Republican, another Republican out of Texas on the committee with me um, to invest in non-intrusive inspection technology at our ports of entry. That does a few things. One, it um, facilitates trade uh, so that we're there, we are able to have trade go through quicker because we can scan, um, uh, scan semis rather than having to divert them to secondary where it takes more uh, customs officers to search, but also uh, that it helps catch the place drugs coming from across the country or coming from across Mexico where 90% of the drugs come through our ports of entry. So to be able to catch the drugs where they're coming through. Um, and so I'm, I'm pleased that we were able to get that passed uh, out of the House and are working hard to get it passed in the Senate. It's been passed out of a committee in the Senate. Um, now, when it comes to a good, reliable labor workforce, uh, I'm proud to have worked on the H-2A Workforce Modernization, so Farm Workforce Modernization Act, uh, which would allow farm uh, dairy farmers to have access to H-2As, as well as um, uh, con farmers for that year round work. And uh, it streamlines the process so you don't have to apply to multiple different agencies, but rather there's just one application. Now I know I'm talking to the Farm Bureau and there's still some issues that we should be working on together to address that. But the fact that we got in the midst of all of the division that we faced in Congress this year and last year, that we got that legislation passed. Legislation passed that was supported by the United States Chamber of Commerce, uh, that was supported by United Farm Workers, as well as dairy farmers uh, gives us a strong foothold for the future. Thank you very much, Representative. Next question. How important is the development of trade agreements to you? What is your stance on the USMCA and how and how is it being implemented? Do you see any major challenges or issues with the new agreement? So I see a lot of opportunity and I'm uh, grateful to have been able to have worked with uh, President Donald Trump to get it passed on the House floor. Uh, and I did that because of what I heard from farmers in the district, um, whether it was a dairy farmer who talked about the price of milk, a uh, pecan farmer who mentioned how it would impact pecan farmers and better serve them. And then across the district, farmers who just said, we need certainty again to get back into a clear agreement. And that's why uh, I was really proud that we were able to uh, uh, get it passed on the floor. I was one of the first Democrats to come out in support of getting to a yes on USMCA. I actually um, chased the chairman of Ways and Means into a coffee shop and said, when are you going to get to this to the floor? We need a date and we need it now. Um, because I knew how important it was uh, to the people that I serve. And now it's about implementation. Now I'm proud to work with the administration to make sure that we're holding Canada accountable because we're going to keep a close eye on the class six um, milk category Category, but also on how they are accepting uh, imports uh, before they put in a tariff. Because right now they're using some pretty misleading practices to say they're willing to accept imports without actually taking them. And, and so I was proud to, you know, at the Ag Committee, brought up the issue and talking with President Trump's uh, trade ambassador about how we go about fixing it. And because the USMCA included stronger enforcement mechanisms, there is a road to hold Canada's feet to the fire. And we need to be doing that. Thank you very much. Actually, that part of what you just answered was part of the next question. And I do want to thank the participants for sending that in. Next question, and this one's from a participant. We appreciate your vote and stance on the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. Although it was passed in the House, the Senate was not able to take it up. 
uh, during the COVID crisis and other concerns. Where do you see this legislation heading to help out our agricultural producers and their employees? I think it is a great beginning to the, the fix that we need when it comes to agricultural uh, workers. Um, I think it has a lot of the strong fixes that we need and it really was the culmination of 30 years of negotiations, almost as long as I've been alive, uh, to figure out how we uh, better support our, uh, our dairy farmers and other year round operations. Uh, it also supports other H2A users, um, making the more streamlined process. And so I hope that the Senate will take it up in the future. Uh, having the problem solvers, a group of 25 Republicans, 25 Democrats who really helped push it over the finish line in the House last time, we now have problem solvers who are working to build connections in the Senate to help get them uh, committed to the same uh, the same work that needs to be done. So I think we're going to, that's one of the ways that we're going to work. It's a bipartisan coalition trying to work with the Senate to get things done, uh, and we'll keep moving from there. Um, but there are other things we'll have to work on to address the H-2A visa process and other uh, ag worker programs. I think there are, you know, the guest worker programs is another opportunity that we should find ways to make it more accessible to smaller farmers. Um, a lot of smaller farmers depend on expensive uh, labor contractors who may use H-2A. And part of the reason why is because uh, they don't have the administrative capacity to, to really make that program work or the housing capacity to make that program work. Now, the Work Farm Workforce Modernization Act includes some additional funding and resources for housing, but that's going to take collaboration on the ground to, to put that to good use. So my office is working to try to set up um, uh, a support network to, to look at what the challenges are that farmers are facing when they try to use the H-2A program so that we can get more folks in the second congressional district uh, making use of that resource and uh, hopefully with the improvements that will get passed into law. Thank you very much, Representative. Another question from one of the participants is, what do you think about the Green New Deal and the effects it would have on the New, Mex New Mexico dairy and cattle producers with its methane rules, as well as the oil and gas industry. You know, I don't think the Green New Deal would work and I don't support it. And I've, I've said that multiple times. I've, I've stood up against my party when they wanted to ban fracking. I think the only, I do believe in climate change. I've said that on the call. I think a lot of folks see it on the ground, but the way that you fix it, the way that you address it, the way that you respond to the impacts is by working together. And that's why we have to have the scientists and engineers and experts in southeastern New Mexico looking at how we can best capture methane, looking at the most um, effective technologies and, and using that expertise rather than ignoring that expertise, which is what I think the Green New Deal did uh, in, in its uh, proposals. I also think that we need to invest in carbon capture sequestration. I think that's a, a place where oil and gas industry can work uh, with conservationists uh, to, to make sure that we're uh, reducing the carbon input or output. And that's why I co-sponsored the Use It Act, which is uh, legislation that would invest in that technology, um, technology that is very similar, similar to the hydraulic fracturing process. So I think there are opportunities to bring the oil and gas industry into addressing these challenges. And we have to do the same when it comes to farmers. You know, I'm really interested as we continue to explore opportunities about what we do with our produced water, how we find the right ways to clean it, and where we think the safe places are to use it. I'm, I'm glad that NMSU uh, has received funds to, to to do some of that research and I'm really eager to work with farmers to hear their thoughts on, on whether that can be part of the solution, whether it's, uh, you know, now so much of it is being recycled in oil and gas production, which I think is great. Uh, and I want to see if there are other opportunities to use it in the future as well. Thank you very much, Representative. And uh, for those who are viewing this uh, uh, Zoom conference this evening, you have an opportunity to give us a question that we could pose to our candidate here with us this evening. This is another question from a participant. How do we address the urban encroachment on agriculture and how do we help inform the consumers of how important agriculture is to everyone? That's such a great question. And, and I, um, it really speaks to me because it is. It's so easy for people who don't farm to take for granted all of the hard work that gets done to put that food on the shelves in the grocery store. And I think COVID actually provided an opportunity for folks to see just a little bit of the pulling back of the curtain of all of the challenges that farmers navigate every single day to make sure that we have a safe and reliable food source. Um, so the question is how do we better uh, better 
make sure that the consumer is educated on those challenges. Uh, I think there's a few opportunities. Um, you know, one is I've talked with a lot of local farmers about how do we label produce or other products? Uh, how do we make sure, you know, if there's an, a, a U.S. farming, the cool uh, movement, for example. Uh, I think investing in that marketing, especially in New Mexico farming, is a really great opportunity to educate uh, New Mexicans on the importance of our ag industry because people see it. I mean, I, I saw it growing up. I, I remember the just how sad I was when the cotton fields that I would walk by to get to um, my middle school uh, turned into a housing development. I remember that. And uh, I think we've got to find other ways to, to kind of educate folks on it. Um, so I think labeling can be a really good one. I know, you know, in the farm bill and in other um, places, there's support for uh, marketing opportunities and using that as more of a strategy. I also co-sponsored legislation to get rid of the fake milk label using milk for uh, almond juice or, or coconut or whatever. Um, because I think that's another thing where folks don't really understand which is which, uh, as well as the fake meat label. Um, so we can find ways to address this through marketing as well as through truth and labeling. That was good. Thank you very much, Representative. Another question uh, by one of our participants. In the midst of COVID-19 and, uh, and all the federal support, how do we get employees back to work when they can make more dollars on unemployment? This is something I've heard across the district, uh, real challenges in terms of getting the labor force that we need to pick our green chili. So thank you so much for asking this. I know it's a urgent uh, need on the ground right now. You can't tell your crops to wait a week until you find the rest of the employees to pick them. So. Um, there's a few things that I've been trying to do, uh, and I'm really eager to hear how things have been affected uh, since the unemployment has run out on the federal side. Uh, but talking with farmers, I really have heard that, that $600 additional was, uh, was, was really rich for New Mexico. And uh, so one of the solutions I proposed trying to get something to catch wind was uh, including also a back to work payment. So if someone was getting off of unemployment, they could get a, a $3,500 one time payment that would help them address challenges challenges like childcare, which is a big challenge right now with a lot of the schools not being open uh, or being fully back open. So if there's a little bit of a payment to help them do that, it helps get them back to work. And then if you look at that, it actually provides more incentive to get them to, to take a job, um, you know, even where the pay is a little less. Uh, also with the problem solvers agreement, so we, when folks stepped away from the COVID-19 negotiations, we worked hard to identify common ground. Um, and one of the things that was included in addition to additional farming support was a decreased that a decreased amount for that unemployment um, what really makes sense just from a matter of fact practical point is that states shouldn't be able to pay uh, people who've lost their job more than they would have made than they would make working right that's that's what's causing it to be really difficult to find farm workers but one of the challenges we saw was that states actually don't necessarily have in the administration their systems aren't set up to take federal money and put it into a payment system where you can calculate that. So what the problem solvers did is they said, okay, we'll extend the 400 uh, additional um, for I think it was a month and a half. But by that time, the states need to have that implemented so that they can make sure that they're not paying someone more than they made before COVID-19. I think that's a good example of how we could, uh, we can work together to get folks back into, uh, back into jobs in, in safe ways, um, while also supporting people who have lost jobs, you know, for example, in the Southeast with the, the decrease in the oil and gas prices right now, um, back, uh, you know, who have lost their jobs. So being there for people in a time of crisis in the midst of COVID-19 and all also getting people safely back to work. Thank you very much, Representative Sochil Torres Small. You mentioned um, produced water. How do we educate the environmental groups that produced water can be used if it meets EPA standards? We have a lot of projects like reseeding pipelines that desperately need a water source to be successful. How can we all work together to do this? 
Oh, I just love that question uh, because it is, it's got to be a way we work together. And, you know, one of the things about uh, trying to build solutions and working with everyone is I get flack from all sides. And I've certainly gotten flack from environmentalists when I talk about reusing produced water. Uh, but I, I think that when people say they trust science, they should really trust science. And so if that's looking at EPA standards uh, and making sure that it, the water is uh, cleaned to that level uh, that we can that we can use it in other ways. Um, now there are still challenges with that. Uh, there's high TDS content, for example, with produced water. So that's the saltiness. That's actually the hardest piece to get out. You know, I know uh, environmentalists talk often about the the sm very small percentage of um, of, of nuclear of um, uh, radioactive uh, elements that are is in the water, and it's true, it's there, but it's very small amounts. And again, in science, it's all about if you're looking at EPA levels for arsenic or other things. It's all about what level is in a certain set of water. So um, we've got to make sure we're cleaning it, but the hardest thing to do is to clean out the salt. And that's why we should be investing in desalination as well as reusing produced water. And if you can get behind one, why can't you get behind the other? Thank you very much. Another question from one of our participants. Do you have any opinions on cloud seeding and how we can leverage this technology here in New Mexico? So I have heard uh, a, a fair amount about cloud seeding and I am really interested in learning more in terms of seeing the studies. One of the challenging things about the data for cloud seeding is that there's so many different variables. So really identifying that that is what is having the impact of um, increased water production in a certain area, I think is gonna be crucial. It's also about figuring out kind of how you would balance the impact of increased water in one area and potential impacts in other areas that also depend on, on that water production. So I would love to learn more about this, honestly. And, and, you know, again, I just gave a big speech about trusting the science. So I'd love to look at some of the data about doing that. Thank you very much. Another question from our participant. And I again want to thank you all for sending these questions in. New Mexico agriculture has real potential, but lacks infrastructure. How can the state work to beef up its indus this industry? And what resources are available to assist in that process? Thank you so much for that question. You know, as we recover from COVID-19 and find ways to rebuild, I think infrastructure is the answer. President Trump has been talking about doing it for four years. I think we have a good opportunity to work together to get this done, and it will help build, give that boost to our economy. You know, we talked about getting people back to work, give, build that boost for our economy to be able to uh, get people back to work and rebuild um, where we need to. There's a few things we need to do. We need need good safe roads, especially in southeastern New Mexico. When people tell you drive safe, it's not a nicety, it's a reality because every time I go out to southeastern New Mexico, I hear about somebody else who's lost their lives there. So we need to prioritize good safe roads. We also need to invest in good reliable internet. I think we've seen that across the board. If any of you have kids who are struggling to learn in the hybrid system or if you're, you're stuck all online, you know how difficult it is. And, you know, kids should be able to do their homework at home, not in the parking lot of a McDonald's. Um, but also when it comes to small business, we want we want to be able to ship our New Mexico products all across the world. We need good, reliable internet to get that done. It also impacts oil and gas operations and well production in rural places. So there's lots of reasons why we need good, reliable internet. And then water infrastructure. I was really proud in this uh, package that we got passed in the house, uh, which came under the $2 trillion price tag. I know that's a lot, um, but was the original negotiating point that the, the president agreed to. So I think, again, there's room for good negotiating ground there. Um, it Include the Western included the Western Water Security Act, which was the legislation about getting more water smart funding, uh, more water infrastructure to better manage our water, um, better assessments of our underground aquifers, all aquifers are underground, all of our under all of our groundwater, uh, and working to make sure uh, that we are, are providing an incentive for collaboration early on, like, like I meant, mentioned earlier. So I think if we can put the right resources into uh, infrastructure, it's a great way to build common ground and a great way to recover in the wake of COVID-19. Thank you very much, Representative. Next question from one of the participants. There has been an increased movement of groups that want to do away with animal agriculture. How would you respond to these extremists at the federal level? And how would you ensure our producers are able to continue to safely feed and clothe our nation and the world? 
That's such a great question when it comes to food and fiber and you know, our long legacy of, uh, of animal farming. And so what I wanna make sure is that we are, again, it goes back to the question of how are we educating the consumer in terms of what uh, the real hard work that happens uh, for uh, on farms and on ranches. And uh, so a few things that I would suggest, I did you know, co-sponsor that legislation to make label only milk as milk. Uh, you can talk about almond water or coconut, whatever, but milk is milk and, and to have some truth in advertising there. And that was frankly, after talking to a lot of farmers about it um, to make, you know, because part of me thought, you know, it's about free speech, but the other part is that we want truth that we want people to know what, you know, what a label says and what it says about nutrition. Um, and same with uh, when it comes to correctly labeling meat products and making sure that there's truth in advertising there. Um, in addition, uh, I think we can work to make sure that we're taking on some of the challenges that our, um, that our uh, wool growers and our ranchers are facing when it comes to processing. I think that'll really help right now. The USDA, you all know, is investigating processors about potential collusion uh, amidst COVID-19 and even before. Um, the over-reliance that we have on these just few meat packers uh, creates a lot of the challenges uh, that, that folks are having to navigate. And so if we can find better ways to, you know, get you know, mobile matanzas or other um, uh, access to uh, meat packing, and then also working to have more transparency in terms of the prices that are set uh, for ranchers. Um, I think that's another opportunity to kind of help navigate some of those challenges uh, so that we can get meat into grocery stores at a fair price um, and that more it, it's continues to be accessible to folks um, as well. Thank you very much. And this will be our last question uh, for this evening. What are the major takeaways you have gained while serving on the House Ag Committee? You know, uh, the big one has been just the gratitude of farmers and ranchers in New Mexico's second congressional district who have taken the time to walk through some of the fundamentals when it comes to uh, the hard work that happens in our ag industry, the work that so many consumers take for granted, and being able to then communicate that to uh, people across New Mexico's second congressional district and also people in the ag committee who are busy fighting for their little chunk of the pie and don't know about the hard work that happens in New Mexico. And one of the things I've seen in the Ag Committee, and one of the things I like the most about it is it's the most bipartisan committee I'm on. I know folks often say that about the Armed Services Committee. That's pretty true. But in Ag, people uh, coalesce around, uh, you know, how rural their state is, what kind of produce they have, what kind of um, uh, different like size of farms they have. And so there's all these surprising opportunities that's why I was really proud to get to work with Dusty Johnson on um, the Farming Support to States Act, which would provide more local relief in the midst of COVID-19 that would tailor to our individual needs, not, again, those dairy farmers in the Midwest, um, but then also finding other ways to, to collaborate, whether it's, uh, again, in the midst of COVID-19, finding ways to uh, get uh, surplus products to uh, food banks uh, for our win-win situation. But it all happens because you're talking to people based on the type of district they represent, not their party. Um, so that's what I love about the Ag Committee, um, and I, I hope to get to continue to learn uh, on that front and to continue to advocate for the type of production that happens in New Mexico so that farmers aren't left behind um, and then have a real voice at the table. Thank you very much. And uh, again, folks, we want to thank all of those who participated, and I know many more will go back and take a look at this uh, Zoom meeting this evening and uh, see what the candidates had to say. I do wanna uh, again uh, reinforce that the uh, New Mexico Agricultural uh, Forum does not support or endorse any candidate. We, they've invited every candidate to be with us. And at this point, I'd like to thank all the ones that have in the past been with us. We've been doing this, I think, for three weeks. So we're very grateful for all those who were able to be with us. And also for you, Representative, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us uh, this evening. So with that being said, I'd like for you to uh, end the, uh, the Zoom conference here with uh, uh, sort of a little bit of an outro and we'll give you three minutes to do so.
Well, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, like I said, this has been a steep learning curve because ag is complex, it is hard, and I love learning about the hard work that happens in New Mexico and being able to find ways to support it. So whether it is increasing trade opportunities, so we have trade, not aid, uh, expanding opportunities, whether it's in China, uh, whether it's in Taiwan with beef, whether it's in uh, looking at the Japan agreements, how do we make sure that we are expanding markets? And it all comes down to what I've heard from the people that I get the chance to serve. Um, whether it was a, a cotton farmer when I was uh, getting back late one night um, back home from DC uh, and he was coming from an international cotton trade conference and, and he said, you know, it might be easy or tempting to think that we live on a little island, but the future of ag for America is going to lie in our ability to build markets across the world. And so I am committed and, and proud of uh, the strides that we have made in that when it comes to the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement and know how much more work we need to do. So I'm, I'm eager to, to get to that work. I'm also eager to represent uh, where the larger family dairy farms that we have, our hardworking chili farmers and pecan farmers and pistachio farmers, the hay that we produce here um, and th that also is a, a really great rotation crop. And most importantly, to get to learn about how we better craft um, the, the farm bill in a way that is going to be responsive to and, and uh, accessible to all of our farmers, how we take on our labor challenges, and how we take on uh, grow, continuing a robust uh, ag economy in the midst of increasing uh, water scarcity. These are challenges that we're going to have to face together, and I'm just so proud to get to learn and so grateful for the New Mexico Farm and Livestock Bureau. Special shout out to Chad um, and Tiffany for all of your hard work uh, in making sure that uh, I am continuing to learn and advocate for New Mexico. Thank you very much, Representative uh, Sochil Torres Small. And on behalf of the New Mexico uh, uh, Consortium of, of uh, Folks, we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. And, on, and also on behalf of Chad Smith, the CEO of New Mexico Farm and Livestock Bureau, uh, Daylene and Tiffany, I'm Matt Martinez. Uh, we uh, want to make sure that on November 3rd, everybody make sure they have voted by then or vote that day it is very important to make sure that we take care of our constitutional duty. So uh, with that, you all have a very safe evening and we will see you soon. Thank you all so much.